Uh, before we get started on that, any questions about um, assignment three or the multiple choice component, right? So questions about the impending assignment three, A3 or, or A3 yeah. I, have an I have a question about um, the written part of the assignment. Okay. Uh, one question, uh, the first one. Uh, you say show like whatever, like G to the T divided by p at i um are we supposed to like use numbers are we supposed to use like a proof system like what's the difference between a proof and a show then like how much it's show it? um showing is you can make some assumptions right a proof has to um leave nothing i i, I don't know it's a little bit um playing around with definitions here but a proof should should have um a proof should look like a published paper, right? It should have everything there that convinces the reader absolutely that it's true, right? It, it doesn't say we're going to assume that or basing on this theory of that, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't make reference to other things that are left unresolved. It resolves everything. Um, and that's why I use the language carefully there. When I say show, I'm saying there are some things that if they're very, very obvious to you, they're obvious to me as well. And you don't have the burden of proof placed on you, right? So it says present, it's, it's basically saying present a compelling argument, but not a bulletproof argument, right? Is that? Okay, okay. So words cannot explain it. Like it still needs to be done like mathematically, like use algebra and stuff. It needs, it needs to be done mathematically. Um, a good idea is, so, and, you know, you said, can I, can you use specific numbers to show something? I mean, I do that all the time, right? When I, I'm about to do it, when we're going to do a crypto system, I'm not going to go right into the theory. I'm going to say, here's an actual set of numbers. Let's play with the numbers, see how they work. And then we'll take a step towards the generalized theory, right? Um, and you can do the same thing. You can start your argument with a set of numbers and say, look, this is how it works in this specific case. And now I'm going to generalize and show that it works like this in all cases. Right. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah. So you, you have, you, I've given you a lot of leeway. The, the, I guess the whole, sometimes it's important to think what, what's the point of the, you know, what's the point of the assignment and, and what's its theme in general is we have these primality certificates and they're based on providing a certificate for order but at every level of that uh, prime factorization right so the first part of the, the first question of the assignment is basically saying you can give a certificate for order right that's verifiable in polynomial time so you establish that in question one and in question two you either do the two specific questions about constructing, uh, proving a prime certificate and then constructing your own prime certificate. Or you can choose to do that induction part, which basically says these things by induction, you can show that they are a value, uh, can be can be certified and you can prove to yourself in polynomial time that they work, right? So that, that the point of the assignment is, is showing that order can be certified and then showing that based on that what you've shown for order being certified, you can actually certify prime numbers and have them be evaluatable or, or you know, you can evaluate that certificate in polynomial time. Got it. Yeah. And for the uh, the coding part, like uh, first question, like la uh, part four, no, I think part five is the coding where we have to prove the, whether it's polynomial time or something like that. I forget the question. Like do you need like an actual python code for it if you so what i was envisioning the python code for would be for example i gave you an, um, an example of a little bit of code right so it was a math pow function where we put it in a loop and had it print out for all the possible exponents from one to n minus one right yes um to that is a way of not only showing, but proving that you have a witness for a given modulus value, right? Uh, because you simply say, look, here, are, it's, it's brute force. There's nothing elegant about it, but you can say, look, all n minus one numbers are there. 
there's not a single repetition of a number. Therefore, that must be a generator for that particular modulus or a valid witness, right? So I was more thinking of if you are going to use Python, you're going to get it to do your brute force work, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're going to say, okay, for this prime factor, right, um, a generator for one minus uh, that that prime factor minus one is this, then you can say because I wrote a little program in Python that actually goes through and checks that all the numbers are there, and then of course you attach that. Right. You don't have to show if it's a printout program, you don't have to show that page is a printout for especially if it's a large number, but you just show what you wrote. Right. Which is the brute force um, program that uh, verifies that you indeed have a correct witness. Right. Yeah. And remember, brute forcing on your end, if you're if you're building a certificate, you can use all the EXP time calculations you want. Right. That doesn't break any rules. You're allowed to spend days and days computing and coming up with the thing that the verifier has to be able to do quickly, right? You don't have to be able to do any of this quickly. Okay, got okay. it. Okay, so if, you, if you're looking at going, these are just little brute force things I'm writing, yeah, that's fine, right? You're building a certificate, you're doing all the work to prove to someone, and they can verify that proof very quickly because you've set it up, right? It's like you're building a house of cards for them to just walk by and go, Psh, oh, it works, right? That's the idea. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, good. Yeah, good. Any other questions? Okay, so there are some questions in the chat here. Let's see. Um, so Dallas asked for assignment three Q one eight. Do we need to solve them algebraically, or can we just explain with words? So again, Dallas, it's up to you, right? It's not. It doesn't have to be bulletproof. But um, one of the things that I'd recommend, if you're not sure how to manipulate them algebraically, again, start with a specific set of numbers and then say in words how in general it would it would work right yeah okay and then you say never mind so i've just answered it twice all right good um okay there are some so some questions about follow-up meetings there is a follow-up meeting starting so i put the schedule for the follow-up meetings actually that's a good thing to talk about now um i spread them out over four days and i did that in a i sort of changed i think before we had them crammed into three days but really at five minutes of meeting, I was running over time. There really wasn't enough time for, you know, basically I'd say, do you have any questions? You'd ask one question, then I look at the clock and well, now I have to ask my question. So we, we were running out of time. So I changed it to seven minutes. I think that'll help a little bit. Uh, but of course, because this class is so large, uh, I had to spread it out over four days. So the schedule is posted on Slate. Find yourself on the schedule. A quarter of you will be today, right? Quarter of you will be on Thursday, and then the other half will be next week. Okay, we have time. We have time to do. We only have to do two more of these quiz meetings, and we we still have plenty of time to uh, to do these. Okay. Um, so Kiefer asked for the primality certificate tree. The value for G is sometimes two, sometimes three. How is that determined? Trial and error. It's so you can write what I recommend is take a look at that template and I use trial and error, right? So when when I gave you the template, I said, let's try two. Oh, look, two doesn't work because I knew it wasn't going to work, right? Let's try three. Three worked. Um, there's no reason why you can't just write a program that starts somewhere and works its way up until it finds its first hit or randomly takes numbers on the interval one to n minus one and tries them and, and until you find one, right? Um, I know from looking at primality certificates, you, people just use two when, it, when it's a generator, when it's a valid witness, and they increment up. So people do that. They start at two and work their way up. Um, a lot of, you know, in the other group, people were asking me, do we have to start at two? And I know, right? So you could pick a random number and pick a very strange generator. And I guess all that will happen is the person evaluating your certificate, which is me in this case, will say, hmm, that's an interesting choice, um, but it seems to be valid and move on, right? So, so you have a lot of freedom there, right? But just be sure you actually do the brute force calculation that, uh, that ensures that that, um, that witness is valid, right? Because if it's not valid, you're not certifying anything. It's not, it has to be able to generate all those N minus one numbers. Or if you're at an arbitrary node, all the V minus one numbers for that particular node V. All right. Um, so 
Uh, Chris asked, um, quiz, quiz will be on, so what we're doing today will be the uh, knapsack cipher, the quiz will be on the knapsack cipher, right? Um, so Dallas Cruz, uh, so for Q1E, can we use pseudocode, can we, can we pseudocode the verifier? Um, yeah, yeah, you can, if you don't want to write actual code to do it, you can, you can write down just uh, lines of, you know, the steps, right? And it doesn't have to be something that will actually run in Python, but it has to be something that's uh, comprehensible, right? So for sure, right? Any, anytime you're asked to write a verify, and you know, the same thing I do on the whiteboard, I write things that wouldn't be valid in Python, but hopefully, at least to me, it's obvious what they are, and hopefully to everyone else, it's obvious how you can easily just make that into something that is, uh, is, is correct in Python in terms of its syntax. Good. Okay, good, those are some good questions. Uh, it shows me at least uh, that uh, people are thinking about these. So let's take another look here. So Ms. Error asks for question two, part A, when it says to manually verify using successive squaring, do we calculate all exponents or do we go up to G to the 172? No, 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 um, by successive squaring. Uh, so for the, um, you're not doing manual count. That's actually a really good thing. So you're not, uh, determining, I'll put this in writing because that's actually a, what I don't want you to do. Not determining um, the valid witness, witness manually. Okay, so don't find, don't search for a valid witness manually. That is a, a lot of work. The whole idea is that's an EXP time process. So you have to brute force that and let Python do that for you, right? Um, but for the manual calculation, um, you should be showing. So remember, there's there's two types of calculations you have to show. You have to show that once you've found a valid witness, when you exponentiate that to the V minus one, it is equal to one, right? So that you have to do with successive squaring. And the other type of calculation you have to do, and you have to do this for every level of the tree, every node level. Um, the other thing you have to show is that the witness raised to the exponent v minus one divided by any one of those prime factors is not equal to one, okay? So you have to do the explanation that shows that one calculation is equal to one and all the other possible calculations involving the prime factors are not equal to one. That's done manually, right? So that one, and it's like on the quizzes. So you've all done this on the quizzes. Um, you're, you're going to use successive squaring. So let's say you need to get to G to the 16, right? You're not going to go G times G is G squared and then G squared times G is G cubed and then G times uh, G cubed times G is G4. You're going to go, here's G squared. And then I take that number and square it to get G4. And then I take that number and square it to get G8. And then I take that number and square it to get G16, right? So that's what you do manually, right? And the reason why I asked to do to do that manually is um, because that's part of the certification process, right? You're basically saying, look, here's on the certification side, I've put every, all my calculations manually and by actually doing them manually and committing them to paper and submitting that as your assignment solutions, that is a proof that you did not do anything beyond polynomial time calculations because every single calculation is there, right? So that's when you actually certify when you when you run the certification process for the prime. Okay, did that did that sort of answer your question? Ms. Sauer, Sauer was thinking about it. Okay, for the second part, we still show that t divided by yes. So that there's, remember, two types of calculations. G to the V minus one must be equal to one. One type, you do that manually. The other type of calculations is G to the V minus one divided by any prime factor, right? Must not be equal to one. You have to show those manually too. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, good. All right, so uh, let's do, so we'll, we're gonna start now there's, there's three topics left to do, right? Um, so the first topic we're gonna do today, which is uh, looking at the knapsack cipher, which is a cipher that's um, uh, adapted from the NP complete problem of subset sum, right? We spent two weeks 
carefully creating these classes, right? So there's P, there's NP, there's EXP time, and then the class in between, the elite group, which is NP complete, we're gonna pluck subset sum out of NP complete and roll it out into a crypto system. Um, and that's the knapsack cipher. So let's do that now. Um, so the way to do this, so the way that I'm gonna do this is I'll start with a specific numerical example, right? Show how the numbers run on the numerical example, and then we'll put in some formulas that allow you to generalize, right? Uh, the general system is in the notes anyways, right? So if you look at my notes, I have the general formulas there. And I also have um, specific examples with more than what I'm gonna use here, which is just four bit, right? Cause on the whiteboard, it's hard to, to fit all the calculations. So as you go to eight bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, it's, it's impractical to do these manually on the whiteboard. So, um, so let's look at what's, what we're gonna call here. We'll call it a four bit, four bit mini sack cipher. Cipher, and the knapsack cipher is based on based on subset sum, subset sum problem, and we know that the subset sum problem is an NP complete. Okay, so subset sum problem, you recall, is NP complete. Okay, and the idea behind this is, uh, you know, as as computational technologies like quantum, uh, quantum computing are developed, um, we will eventually have to leave behind integer factorization order finding, right? So it's just a matter of fact as those, as those uh, technologies improve, improve to the point where they're able to factor larger and larger numbers, we're gonna need alternatives. So even though this, this crypto system, it's old, it's from the late 70s and it was broken in the uh, mid 80s, it's sort of a template for how you can just pick things out of NP complete. Because remember, NP complete, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, it's still a good template for picking problems out of NP complete that may not be vulnerable to uh, quantum computing um, and creating crypto systems, right? So who knows what we're going to end up with, but it could be that we end up picking something out of the NP complete group. Right? So uh, you recall subset sum. This is the idea. So let's take a specific example subset sum. I'm gonna cut, cut them down to um, just four elements, right? So a good group of integers to use here. Let's use the integer group seven, three, 15, and five, okay? So let's say we have our set is equal to S is equal to, and I don't know why this is not working for me. Let's try another one here. S is equal to seven, three, 15 and five, okay? And let's say we're given a target and that target is perhaps the first, the second, and the last elements all summed in this, okay? So we have the target as T is equal to seven plus three is 10 plus five. Actually, let's pick, maybe let's pick a different target. Let's pick the first and the two last, right? Because that gives 27, okay? So T is equal to 27. So there's our target T is equal to 27. Again, we know that this is in subset sum because we can present the certificate for it, which is simply gonna be, look, if I take the first one, the second last one, and the last one, the sum of those numbers, 15 plus five is 20 plus seven is equal to 27, okay? The idea behind the knapsack cipher is actually to use a binary representation of that certificate as information that you're gonna encrypt. Okay, so the certificate for this, we're gonna write it as, so again, let's name these elements. This one we're gonna call S1, this is S2, this is S3, this is S4, okay? So S subscript refers to elements in the original um, set for subset sum. And we're gonna represent our actual um, certifi certificate for this using a sequence of binary numbers, okay? So those binary numbers, we'll call them B1, B2, B, B4. And in this instance, if we take a series of binary numbers, namely 1, 0, 1, 1, that's a binary representation of the certificate for this particular problem. So in binary, this will be 1, 0, 
Okay. And what we've done is we've set up a, so again, this is a binary string. We've set up a binary string such that we have solution, right? If and only if the sum from i is equal to one to four. Again, because we only have four elements in our set, so we only need four bits. Um, times bi times si is equal to t. So again, this is a good example. So Dallas, you're asking before about how do we go from specific numbers to generalization, right? You can start and frame your, uh, you know, frame your argument using specific numbers because everyone can see them and work through them. And then you show in general what you do. So specifically with these numbers, what I have when I evaluate the sum of bi times si is equal to t, on the left-hand side, I have this bit times this number, this bit times this number, this bit times this number, this bit times this number. So basically the ones and zeros tell you which elements to put in your set. Okay, so the left-hand side of this equation would be one times seven, right? So this is one times seven plus zero times three, plus zero times three, plus one times 15, times 15. That's uh, zero to read, one times 15, plus one times five, times five. Okay, so those are your, your bits, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, right? Now you add them up and you get 15 plus five is 20, plus zero is still 20, plus seven is equal to 27, 27, and that's what you have on the, the right hand side, that was T. Okay. So here's your specific um, set of numbers for this set. And then what you do in general for any set of size N, right, which will have a certificate of size N as well, at least when we present it in this fashion, right? You have n elements here. You're going to be n. You're going to need n n bits to do this, right? So the idea in the knapsack cipher is actually take this piece of information and encrypt it using the subset sum problem. In other words, encrypt it by giving the actually pub publishing the set right seven three fifteen and five, and the target that's associated with that. Okay, so that's idea. That's the idea of the knapsack cipher. The idea is we're going to encrypt, encrypt that binary string b1, b2, b3, b4 um, as t is equal to 27, right? As t, as simply the sum t, right? And what we do, our public key is going to be this. So this will be this will be the ciphertext. This will be the plain text, and our public key is going to be the original set S. Okay, as T using a public key key S. Okay. So it's actually the certificate that's the original piece of information in binary. Right. And you can see how we're doing this as a mini four bit, right? And it's not very practical as four bit, but upping it to 256 bit, 512 bit means the problem will be very, very difficult to solve, right? Even with this, this public key that's provided. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a good system for, you know, uh, you know, blocking various sizes of information. Um, so there's some immediate problems that come up when you when you do this. So we'll just look at some of those problems. So let me take a look here at oh one one problem is so these are the immediate problems. Okay, so the issues or problems, right? So one problem that's going to come up is let's say we are given the so again this is our plain text text text. This is the ciphertext text. The public key is S, right? So first problem is let's say we're given something like a sum of 15, right? So first problem is can be given as an example. Example, well, T is equal to 15. So we're given a ciphertext of T is equal to 15, right? And we go to decrypt that 
well, when we decrypt it, we're going to realize that there's not a necessarily, in this case, a unique solution for 15. 15 I can form by just taking the third element, okay? So, example, T is equal to 15, it decrypts as decryption. I have 0, 0, 1, 0. So, 0, 0, 1, 0 is a valid original plain text that produces the ciphertext of 15, right? given this reference of this, um, this set, right? Of course, the other thing that would sum to 15, I can take 7 plus 3 plus 5. This gives me 10 plus 5, okay? So we have, or it could have been 1101, 1101. And both of those are valid plain texts for this one ciphertext, right? And as we know from looking at various crypto systems, that's horrible, right? You can't have ciphertext that uh, decrypts multiple ways. It has to have one unique decryption. Otherwise, the person on the other end won't know what the message is. They'll have an array of messages that they have to go through, and it creates more problems. Okay. So by example, what I mean is this, this problem generalizes to we may, not always, but we may have non-unique unique decryptions, right? Non-unique decryptions. Okay, so we have to solve that. That's something that has to be solved. It's solvable by introducing the idea of a super-increasing set here, okay? Before we do that, there is another problem here. And the other problem is when we decrypted, right? So when you're given the ciphertext 15, you looked at this and you said, okay, there's 15 there, right? So I know that that's a solution. And then are there any other solutions? Oh yeah, if I take the sum of seven, three, and five, I can get 15 as well. That is a, an illusion that that's easy because it's so small. We only have four bits, right? If this was an array of 256 integers, we were given some ciphertext, it might take us an awful long time just to come up with one solution. And that's because it's an EXP time problem. Subset sum is NP complete, which means if you're not given any information about the actual um, solution, it can take you exponential time to find one, right? So that's the second problem that we need to resolve is decryption. Decryption won't always, right? So in the average case, it may be actually quite easy to solve the subset sum problem, but worst case, it could be an EXP time process, just decrypting the ciphertext you, you've been given. Okay, so decryption is worst case, worst case, EXP time, right? And it's worst case, EXP time. Okay, and we can't have that as well, right? So the idea here is there's, there's one, one thing we can do to at least get rid of this non-unique decryption and to also speed up decryption time. Right? And that is to introduce a super increasing sequence as our reference set. So let's do that. Let's introduce a super increasing sequence. Okay. So the solution to what apparently appears to be the solution to these two problems is use super increasing sequence. Super increasing sequence. Okay, so super increasing, all it means is you treat the elements in your set as a sequence, and as you go from left to right, what you have to have is that the sum of all the numbers that came before your current number has to be less than the value of that current number, right? So this set S would not be super increasing. The first one, it can be whatever you want, but the second number, 3, right, is not greater than the sum of 7 plus nothing, right? Um, this number would work, right? So this number 15 is greater than 7 plus 3 is equal to 10. This number would not because 5 is not greater than 15 plus 3 plus 7. Okay, so again, let's give a specific example, just four numbers that are super increasing. Um, I'm going to use these numbers here. So the numbers that, that, because I've done a little example here that works out. Let's use the numbers 3, 7, 11, and 30. Okay, so let's pick... 
super increasing s, which is 3, 7, 11. Okay, so first let's just verify that this sequence is super increasing 3. There's nothing to check, right? 7, 7 is greater than 3, so that's fine. 11 is greater than 3 plus 7. Okay? So 3 plus 7, 3 plus 7 is equal to 10. 10 is less than 11. Okay, so so far the first three terms are super increasing. The last one to check is 30, right? So we need to check that 30 is greater than 3 plus 7 plus 11. So we have 3 plus 7 plus 11 is equal to what? 21. 21 is less than 30. Okay. So that's all super increasing is, right? Um, and you have a lot of freedom when you're generating a super increasing set. All you have to do is to calculate the next, a valid next term, keep a running total of all the numbers that were before, add the last number you just created into that, and pick a number that's larger than that, right? So it's not like there's an EXP time process to generate these. You, you can easily write an algorithm that generates any number of super increasing sequences of any length for you, right, to do this. Okay, so one of the things that this thing corrects for, which is good, is that it takes away the capability of a ciphertext having non-unique decryptions, right? So, and that's one of the things, so if you look at, there's a bunch of exercises associated with this week, right? Um, one of them is to actually prove that given S is super increasing, we cannot have any um, ciphertext that creates multiple solutions on decryption, right? It's just not possible, okay? Um, and it's related to actually elementary number theory, why that's true, right? So I'll let you think about that. So super increasing sequence actually solves this problem of non-unique decryptions. Um, but it actually, so it's a classic example of, it fixed problem number two, but it, it fixed it too much. And it introduced a new problem, which is now decryption is too easy, right? So super increasing fix is problem number one, but problem number two, it's now too easy. Okay, and to give you an example, um, let's pick uh, an appropriate sum here. So let's say we're given the uh, ciphertext of 44. So example, let's say the ciphertext T is equal to 44. Okay, so do I have to investigate all the possible 2 to the 4, which will be 16 sums here to actually find 44? The answer is no. This has, there's a simple algorithm because this is super increasing that solves it in polynomial time. And the algorithm, it's called the greedy algorithm, but um, what it does is it takes the sum and it says, okay, you gave me a sum of 44. I'm going to just subtract the largest numbers from the sequence that I can every step. Then that guarantees me I will actually find the solution in one, two, three steps in this case. Okay, so here's the example. So we need to um, decrypt 44, right? So let's decrypt 44. What I do is I start with 44, and then I look at the largest number in the super increasing sequence. If I can subtract that, I do, and I can. Okay, so 44 minus 30 is equal to what, 14. Now I take that result of 14, and I go to the next element in the super increasing sequence. Can I subtract 11 from 14? The answer is yes. Okay, so 14 minus 11 gives me 3. Now I go to the next number in the super increasing sequence, 7. Can I take 7 away from 3? No, so I skip it. I must be able to, if this is a valid ciphertext, I must be able to subtract this last number, and I can't. Okay? So 3 minus 3 is equal to 0. And although it doesn't look like it, right there is your solution. Right? So this says 3, 11, and 30, 3, 11, and 30. Therefore, right, so let's do it a different color here. We've taken elements 3, 11, and 30. And 3, 11, and or in that order. That implies that the plain text was 1, 0, 1. Text. Okay, and that's why I say it's now made too easy. 
Before it was too hard. It was an EXP time problem. Now with the super increasing sequence, we've created, we've corrected the most important error, right? Which is that you always get a unique decryption, um, but it's too easy. Okay. So, and there's a fix for that too. That's what we'll do. We'll flip the board and do the final fix. There's one more fix to go, but before we get to that, any questions about what we've done so far? Okay. So questions so far. Just to summarize, right? Adapting the subset sum problem into a, a cipher where you're encrypting the solution to the subset sum problem. You're encrypting it by presenting a ciphertext, which is a part of the subset sum problem, it's the target, right? And you're publishing a public key, which is the actual set. Right? And um, I have a question. Yep, yeah, sure, so, go ahead. Um, in the beginning, um, why do you map it as a binary if it's a decimal number we're looking at? Like I get seven is one, and then uh, plus 15 gives you another number, and plus five equals 27. So you're turning on those bits, correct? Yes, yeah. those are the bits you're going to use. But right. how, do, how do you, like, how are you just uh, able to go into uh, binary times a decimal number, like 1 times 7 plus 0 times 3? Like, how do you justify that? Uh, 1 times 7, 0 times 3? Yeah. Because it's a, so when you're, when you're just dealing with single bits, uh, you can use, you can still do multiplication. And you don't need to worry about converting this into, but you could convert it into binary, right? And in fact, so this is the thing. In fact, this is a binary number stored somewhere. And we're just saying now sum in binary, the first, not the second, the third, and the fourth. I got it. Okay, okay. Right? So it's, it's just a matter of, because I'm writing it on the whiteboard, not everything's in binary because I'm not a computer, right? But right. The, the whole thing is actually uh, represented in binary, right? Got it's just a convenient way. It's just a convenient way of instead of, you know, when we usually present the certificate, we'll say the certificate is 7, 15, and 5, right? Well, if this is a public key, I don't have to reference the numbers 7, 15, and 5. They're there in an array. All I have to mention is the element number in the array. So I'm going to take the first, not the second, the third, and the fourth. Right? I got it. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so Kiefer asks, so there's no private key? Not yet. Not yet. The private key is the trap door, right? You're going to have to create a trap door with a modulus U and a multiplier V. And U, V are going to be the private key. Okay. There's always a private key <laughs> for anything that works. Okay, so let's do that. Let's, uh, let's create. So what we're going to do, we have to solve this problem of it's too easy to decrypt. Right, so we're going to solve it by introducing, like Kifa said, we're going to introduce a private key, which is going to be U and V. Um, sometimes those are called the trapdoor pair. Right, so let's do that on the next board. We'll introduce a trapdoor and show how that fixes everything. Okay, so we'll add the private key key. And the private key is going to be U and V. And there's conditions for U and V. Um, it helps if we have an example going on. So let's pick those same three numbers, 3, 7, 11, and 30. Okay, so the, remember, so this is our, our private key, our public key, public key, key is S. And in this particular, again, I'm going to fill it up with some some numbers just so we can run the numbers as we go along but it'll be obvious how you can generalize this so s was what are our numbers again the numbers we just had were 3 7 11 and 30. okay so 3 7 11 and 30. okay so s is a super increasing sequence right 3 7 11 and 30 we verified that before um, our conditions for the private key are, first of all, V has to have an inverse mod U, right? So the private key, this is the first condition, then V inverse mod U has to exist, okay? And of course, if we need an inverse mod U, what that means is U and V have to be relatively prime or GCD UV is equal to one. So therefore, GCD 
GCD of U and B must be equal to one. Okay, so we have to pick numbers that are relatively prime so that we can get an inverse for V. V is gonna be our multiplier. So if we're gonna multiply something by V, obviously to decrypt, we're gonna need an inverse for it, right? Um, there is another condition, and that other condition, again, it's part of the more detailed sort of theoretical part of the knapsack cipher, which is that U has to be greater than twice the largest number in the super increasing sequence, okay? So there's another one, and u must be greater than two times s sub n, where s sub n is the largest, largest value in s. Okay. And I say s sub n because it's typically the last one, unless there are some variants of the knapsack cipher where you scramble the order of these, it'll still work. But the, the traditional way of writing them out is in, in uh, increasing order, right? And when you do that, that means the rightmost or the last one you wrote down, we call it S sub n, is, um, is the largest value in S, right? So, and again, there's a good reason for that, and it's in one of the exercises, right? One of the exercises, and as you sort of use the knapsack cipher, you're getting that, you're, you'll get an idea why you have to have that criteria in there, okay? Um, so for our example, let's go ahead and do this. Let's create a private key that satisfies those two parameters and we'll create one specifically for the super increasing set S. So right off the bat, here's our largest value. So I know U has to be greater than two times 30, right? So specifically in this case, we have, that's our largest value. So I know that U must be greater than two times 30, which is equal to 60. So what I've done is I've picked the next largest prime. Uh, so the, the first prime that I found above 60, which was 61, right? And obviously the advantage with picking a prime is that now you're free to pick any multiplier you want, right? Because everything within the range of one up to the prime is gonna be relatively prime to that prime. So we'll choose, we'll choose u is equal to 61. And to keep the multiplication process really simple, I actually picked a multiplier, I think it was v is equal to 3, right? So we're going to choose u is equal to 61 and pick v is equal to 3. And again, this is arbitrary. Arbitrary. Arbitrary, but it actually satisfied, you can, you can check, but the GCD of 61 and 3 is in fact equal to 1, right? Because 61 is prime. But you do check it out, the GCD of 61 and 3 is equal to 1, okay? Because 61 is a prime number. Uh, you don't have to pick a prime number. You pick an, uh, as long as you pick a multiplier that's relatively prime to you, you're okay. Okay? So, um, with this private key now, we have, some, we have a specific value for that. We have u is equal to 61, b is equal to 3. So that's our private key in this case. The key, private key is u is equal to 61 and v is equal to 3. Okay. Um, now what we can do is take that multiplier and map this super increasing sequence into a, into a sequence that on its surface doesn't look like it's super increasing. The way that we're going to do that is we'll call the, it's called the trapdoor set. And so we create a trapdoor, trapdoor set, call that A. Okay, and A is going to consist of the values A sub 1 in this case, A sub 2, A sub 3, and A sub 4, right? And those elements are calculated, remember these were S1, S2, S3, S4. Those elements here in A are calculated by taking S and multiplying by V mod U. So that's our general strategy where every single A value you see here, AI is equal to SI times V mod Okay, so that is our, uh, the way that we map super increasing sequence to the trapdoor set or the trapdoor sequence 
is to take each of those numbers and multiply them by the multiplier, right? And we do everything mod u. So now we can do that. Let's calculate. So therefore, a is going to be equal to, and we can cram a bunch of calculations in here and then evaluate them. So we're going to have 3 times 3 mod 61. Right? So 3 times 3 mod 61 is going to be our first one. Right? Now we're going to have 7 times 3 mod 61. 7 times 3 61. Next one is going to be 11 times 3 mod 61 times 3 mod 61. And finally, our last one, 30 times 3 times 3 mod 61. So what's that equal to? Some of these are actually, uh, uh, we don't need a calculator for. So 3 times 3 is just 9. So this value is just 9. 7 times 3 would be 21. 11 times 3 would be uh, 33. Okay, so let's actually space it out a little bit more here. 33. And finally, this one. So 30 times 3 would be 90, right? Mod 61. If you take 61 away from that, that would leave 29, right? So that would be your 29 right there. Okay. So now we've mapped this super increasing sequence to what's called the trapdoor set or the trapdoor sequence using our private key. And that one... Um, is not super increasing. So, and in fact, the first is just by chance that the, the for actually it's not by chance because we haven't gone through the modulus yet. So the first three actually are super increasing. So 9, 21 is greater than the sum of 9 and nothing. 33 is just greater than the sum of 21 plus 9, which would be 30. But 29 is not greater than the sum of 33 plus 21 plus 9. So this is not a super increasing sequence. What that means is on the decryption, um, whoever's decrypting it can't just run, uh, without knowledge of the private, of the private key, they can't just run the greedy algorithm to solve the subset sum problem, okay? So we've count, so now everything is fully fixed, right? The uniqueness of the decrypted uh, plain text is, is maintained because at the source, we're using a super increasing sequence and we've made decryption without the private key hard but with the private key, it's easy. So we can do we can do an ex, uh, an example of that, right? So let's show an encrypt decrypt. So this is our setup here. Okay. So let's do an encryption, encrypt, encryption. What's a good string to encrypt? Let me take a look at what we did before here. We did the same pattern. So I did the same pattern. One zero one one. So encryption, let's encrypt 1011, okay? And to encrypt 1011, I'm not going to use this original um, super increasing sequence. I'm going to use the trapdoor sequence and do my multipliers of 1 times 9, 0 times 21, 1 times 33, and 1 times um, 29, okay? So when we encrypt it, we get T prime, this is our new ciphertext, is going to be equal to 1 times 9, times 9, 0 times 21, 0 times 21, plus uh, 1 times 33, times 33, plus 1 times 29. Okay, um, and when you add up, so you have 9, 33, so 9 plus 0 plus 33 plus 29, and that should add up to 71. Zero, 33 plus 29 is up to 71. So on the encryption end, here's the information we want to encrypt, 1011. We're going to multiply that again by those values in the trapdoor set to get our ciphertext of 71. So 71 is what we send. Um, the public key is this trapdoor, right? So um, again, this, this used to be public, right? Now it's not. Okay, so this is not public anymore. In fact, what is public is this one. Okay, so A is now here. Okay, 
it's a trap door sequence which conceals that it's a super increasing set is now the public key. Um, so you've encrypted that information on the decrypt, right? Again, you can't go into using the greedy algorithm. So on the decrypt, someone can only do this with knowledge of the private key. They're going to take that public key set and for each element in it, they're gonna um, have to calculate the inverse of three mod 61 and multiply that by every single value they see there, right? So here's the decryption process, right? Decrypt, decrypt, T prime is equal to 71. The first thing we're gonna need is the inverse of V prime, uh, inverse of V, okay? So we need V inverse mod U, right? And in this case, that's the inverse of three mod 61. And surprise, surprise, you're using the extended, U extended Euclidean algorithm yet again to calculate the inverse of something mod U, right? It's like it never goes away. It's always there lurking in the background, right? The EEA is the king of all algorithms, right? So here we go. Uh, we need the inverse of three uh, mod U. So this is three inverse mod 61. And this one's going to be over really quickly, right? We have 60, 61, 61, and 3, S and T values. You can do your own version here if you want, but this will be a 1, 0, 0, 1. And then basically the one line that you have to do here to get the inverse is 61 is 20 times 3, right? So 61 minus 20 times 3 is equal to 1, right? So 61 minus 60 is equal to one. That's gonna stop your algorithm and our inverse is gonna come from this column. Zero minus 20 times one is minus 20. Okay. And minus 20 plus the modulus of 41 gives an inverse of 41. Okay, so therefore B inverse is equal to 41. So that'll be our inverse there. So there's just a question here. So Christopher says, what if the largest value of S is greater than T, the largest value of S here. Just about which, uh, which value of S are you referencing? Sure. Yeah, I'm not quite sure, uh, 9.1. Okay, I'll take a look at that in a, in a minute, right? I'll look at the specific question. I just want to get this general this general one done, but I'll, we'll put that on the back burner for now. Um, so we have our inverse, right? So the inverse is 41. And now what we want to do is get, um, get the original super increasing set back, right? So for this one, all we do is take 9 and multiply it by 41. 21 times 41, 33 times 41, and 29 times 41. Okay, so we take that value of 41 and we calculate S. So S is going to be equal to these values, nine, nine times 41 mod 61. This one is, and you know what we'll do is, I won't write the mod 61s in, we'll just say everything at the end is mod 61. So nine times 41, 21 times 41 and 33 is 41 Finally here, 29, 29 times 41. These are all 61. And when you do that, I'm sort of running out of time here, so I'll just see what I got before. When I did this, I got, so you'll get, when you do that, you'll get the original super increasing set, three, seven, 11, and 30, right? So this gives you Evaluate all these multiplications mod 61. Right? Um, and now the last thing you have to do is transform this T prime back to the original target, right? Because you can't just solve that subset sum problem for this target because it's the wrong target. You need to get the original target T. So the original target T. And T is going to be equal to T prime times V. 
times V mod U, which is equal to T prime, which is 71 in this case, times 41 mod 61. Okay, and that one should be our original target. So let me just see when we did that. I got the original target of 44, right? So this is this would be the original target of 44. All right. So I've run out of room on the whiteboard here, but basically this is how it goes. This is what we just did on the previous whiteboard, right? So given a target of 44 in a super increasing set, we can solve that using um, the uh, greedy algorithm in polynomial time, right? So if you remember, that was on the other, on the other whiteboard here. It's right, right there. So now you do this step. So I've, I've run out of room, but this is what you put in. Solve it using the greedy algorithm. Okay. So there you go. All right. So your private key. So just to highlight some things, private key specifically in this case is sixty-one and three. So key for you asked earlier, is there a private key? Yes, there is, you bet, there it is. Um, the public key is this trap door. It's your public key, which is the trap door set A. Um, and then the ciphertext that you sent is generated using that trap door set. And again, because this comes from a super increasing set, the encryption, the decryption will be unique but unless you know U and V to map your trap door set to the original super increasing, there's no way of solving this in polynomial time um, in the worst case, right? Sometimes you do get lucky in the subset sum problem where the solution is obvious, right? Uh, but again, there may be cases that take EXP time to solve it without knowledge of the, the private key. Okay. Um, under the decryption, uh, yeah. Where did you get the 211 mod 61? Two. Or is that all or on the right side, the arrow pointing towards the... Oh, this is all. All? all? Okay. So, yeah, so, every, so just everything is, is mod, mod 61. All mod 61. I was basically running out of room, right? So yeah, yeah no problem. Got 41 mod 61 gets you through. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so Chris also had a question about 9.1. Let's just check that out here. So exercise 9.1, where T is, oh, I see what you're saying. If T, yeah, okay, so Chris, to answer your, your question, in 9.1a, you're given a target 551, and the largest value in S is greater than that, so you do not subtract 768 from 551. Right. So that was, I see what your question was now. Right. And that we actually did that in our greedy algorithm. Right. When we did this one, if you come across at any point right, in the decryption, or it, this is just if you're solving a super increasing sequence um, and someone accepts it, some, if at any point you, you have a number and that number is smaller than the next element in your super increasing se sequence, you just skip it. So in 9.1a, all you have is the largest element in the super increasing sequence is greater than the target. So you skip it and it becomes a zero, right? It's a zero. Okay. Um, and the plain text would be the elements in S that add up to T. Yeah, the plain text would be this, right? So in this case, the plain text would be one, zero, one, one, right? R. So when you solve T is equal to 44 on this super increasing sequence, you'll find that 44 is equal to three plus 11 plus 30, right? So solving this problem, let's just write that in here. So three plus 11 plus 30, so three plus 11 plus 30 is equal to 44. Therefore, on the decryption side, the original ciphertext is one zero, sorry, the original plain text is one zero one one, which is what we had here. So we encrypted one zero one one at 71. Now we are able to polynomial time get one zero one one on the decryption side. Yeah. Good. Okay.
So uh, when exercises are sort of up for grabs now, basically, except for the theoretical stuff, which is 9.6 and 9.7, 9.1 to 9.5 are just, um, you know, running this crypto system. So try slash prepare, prepare slash study uh, 9.1 to 9.5. Okay, so try those out. Um, and if you're if you want to check your solutions, there are uh, an an, there's an answer key right for each of those 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, 9.5 um, to help you out. Good. So any other last minute questions here? Okay. Good. Uh, so, uh, what do we have next? Next up, we have the quiz meetings, right? So, who's first today? Uh, Arsene, Kevin, and Megan, you're first. Um, so, I'm going to see about, I think there's about eight meetings this morning. So, those those of you who are, have your um, quiz meetings scheduled for this morning, we'll see you shortly. Everyone else, we'll see you on Thursday. Okay? See you on Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye.